right, everybody, welcome to another episode of UX Pathways. And I have the honor to be to have in my presence Molly Holschlag. Molly, how are you today? I'm doing well. How about yourself, Mark? Really good, really good. Excited to have you part of the podcast today. And we've been interviewing people and asking them, you know, how do they get into this crazy industry? And I, I'm curious to understand what is your current role at the moment? I know you've done so many things in your career. I have, and I've been very fortunate in that regard. Uh, and I think it's very reflective of the generation that we created because. Prior to the web, um, people were not as mobile. They stayed in their industries for a very long time in their specific jobs for their careers. And one of the things that I think um, has been very beneficial both to my own life and to the ability to be more agile, if you will, in addressing needs for developers and designers and uh, user interface and user engineering folks along the way and user experience folks along the way has been to have these different seats or wear different hats. Uh, right now, um, so a few years ago, I became very ill and I retired, um, semi-retired. I always, you know, I try to stay involved and keep up with um, specs and recs and practices and all of that. And then um, I was thinking of going into a PhD program and looking at ways to do uh, some form of higher education that would have organized a lot of the details that we do in web development, design, user experience, accessibility, and all of these things, and create real curriculum that would be lasting, sustainable, adaptable, and evolutionary, and evolve with the web and be able to, you know, not be these kind of staid and stoic uh, academic programs that don't change very much um, because we are a very rapidly changing environment as people know. So how do we become more agile was the big question I was answering. And when I was, I stepped out on back into LinkedIn in order to begin evolving relationships around the educational needs uh, for our industry. And all of a sudden, one of my publishers from the past, because I've written a lot of books, um, was like, well, you know, if you really want to do that, you could work, write a book for us if you'd like. And that, I was like, you know what, that might be a better way to go because, uh, you know, the PhD I was looking at would have been six to eight years, which is a huge commitment. So I figured, well, let me just, let me just put together some ideas. And I did. And um, so I'm about to write my 36th book. It's called Included redefining accessibility for the world wide web and it's with john wiley and sons um and it's expected within probably the next six months or so we should see it um and i'm working on that right now so that's what i'm focusing on that's exciting so you talked about all the hats you wore how did you get started in this profession so um i'm i'm an elder um and i was uh you know, to, I was talking to a friend who's like, well, I was, I wasn't 18 until I got my first phone and I was, or cell phone. And I was like, when I was 18, there was no such thing as a cell phone. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so um, it's just very funny to think about it. Um, I didn't come to computers and computer science until much later in, in my life, until about 29, 30 years old. Uh, maybe 28 or so, when I began doing internet-based work before the World Wide Web, um, I had come from um, my, my background, my, my uh, education background is all technical communications, writing, media studies. Uh, by the time I got to the New School for Social Research to do my master's in New York, um, they had a pilot program that they were running off of a BBS called Connected Ed. So I have one of the first uh, fully electronic uh, delivered master's degrees from a very, not only a, accredited institution, but a very well-renowned institution, feeder school at that time, to MIT for the media lab. So I went into that program. And of course, at that point, they were still on a BBS running out of the New Jersey Institute of Technology. <laughs> so I had a very, very um, interesting alternative uh, education and the things just all kind of rammed into each other. You know, so it wasn't an intentional thing. It wasn't like I was not of an age where you could grow up and decide, oh, I'd like to be in web or I'd like to be in, you know, you could become a user experience designer, user engineer for software, but that was never my real interest. My interest was language 
communications, content, and media studies, not in the sense of media and advertising like social media, but media from the new school perspective, if you know anything about the new school for social research, it does not allow a study or it didn't at the time that I was going to it to be, uh, to, to occur without um, a very in-depth look at the social ramifications of what you were doing. So that really excited me. And when I saw the collision uh, at the rise of the web in 1992, Three is when I first saw it on links. I saw it, you know, really pure very early on. And what I saw going on there, I said to myself, first of all, there was no user experience involved other than being able to integrate or use your, your uh, computer, right? If you could use your computer and you could use a modem, you could use the web, all right? It was that simple. It was that simple. So now we're 30 years into an industry and we're looking at all of these automations and these all da, 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 and it's become a, a, what I really think is a big mess. Um, so I really didn't come at it from a designer or a user experience uh, perspective. I came at it from a semantic and linguistic and uh, meaningful and content driven perspective. And to me, the issues that we're finding with user experience have a lot to do with the fact that we're obfuscating content. We are not making, we're no longer doing a semantic web. We have walked away from the web and we're really building applications now. And that is not what the web is meant to be. So user experience is in a very vague uh, and uh, uh, con disconcerting place, I think, in the web uh, right now. Uh, I, I think there's a one size fits all attitude and it's, it doesn't work. What do you think about that? It definitely has evolved. I mean, it's changed from what it, its original intent and has really become something else. I mean, there's been Web 1.0, Web 2.0. There's been talks. I don't think anyone has, has officially said Web 3.0 has begun. But if it hasn't, it probably has already. <laughs> I don't think, I mean, I think it's, it's very hard. It's like versioning wars to me. The reality is, is that since humans have been humans, there's some warring faction going on. There's never been a day without violence, right? So why version the web? The web is an emerging technology. So right away, there's a certain ph philosophical um, difference in my, at least in my way of looking at things is that the versioning is something that people want to do in order to say, well, that, gen that 10 years did this. Now we're doing this. Now we're doing that. There was a long-term plan, Mark. There was always a long-term plan. Now, of course, long-term plans, you know, you, 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 or, you know you, you're driving down, a, let's say you're going on a vacation and you're, you're, you've had a plan for your vacation and you come across an unexpected blockage in the road and you have to make a detour, right? And that does happen. But that doesn't mean it's a new web. It's not a new web. In fact, what we're doing is we're recreating an era of programming for application development. And we are using technology. We're trying to force web-based technology to do what programming is supposed to do. I think we're at, at, a, at a crossroads in our industry right now. And we have got to make a decision uh, whether we are building applications or we are building web sites. The two are not the same. We had thought, I believe, when we began to evolve web languages and we began to evolve the idea, especially with this content being semantically structured in an HTML document, that can then be delivered to multiple places using the media equals all, okay? This is a, a meta element, right? Or a meta, a meta tag with an, uh, 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 excuse me, a meta attribute uh, and value, media equals all or media equals handheld, with the idea that we would be expanding this content to reach um, the smartphones, but we didn't have a smartphone in 1993. We didn't see smartphones until Apple iPhone wasn't until 2006. So now are we developing for this or are we developing for desktop or are we developing for cloud-based services? We don't, we haven't figured these things out. And I think what's happening is now we're just putting everything into a user interface without thinking about how or why this is affecting users. 
And there seems to be a complete turn away from real user testing into this entire automated process, which can be helpful in quality assurance, but it is not the answer in my opinion to let machines pretend to be humans and users. When you become a user of the web and you step away from the, I mean, I was, I stepped out, you know, and really became a user and began to absolutely hate the experience. And the older I get, the more difficult it is becoming. And I can barely interact with the technology around me when in 1993, it was the most empowering thing in my life. So I think in 30 years, we may have done some amazing things, but we've also left out a huge number of people that we had invited in. And that's really the accessibility issue. Yeah. And accessibility yeah. keeps being consumed under user experience. And it is part of the user experience. But more importantly, I think that we have to shift the entire perspective and say accessibility for the web. And this is where my book is really going with the redefining accessibility for the World Wide Web, which is saying, instead of the tack it on mentality, let's make this user interface and accessible after the fact, or we're not gonna do it because it costs too much money or all of these fallacies. It's really to turn it around and look through the eyes of accessibility because when you look at what access means, if you can't get to it, you can't use it, can you? So accessibility first is really where I'm going. And I'm really beginning to switch my ideologies to say, if we don't look at access as the on-ramp of the World Wide Web for all people who want to come, and we do not consistently provide a user experience that is accessible to as many people who can access it literally, we have no on-ramp to the highway, we can't drive the car on our vacation, can we? So <laughs> I really think that there's a problem there and we have, we have to get away from this and we do see a social shift. We do see a social shift. Mm -hmm. So that is giving me some, some comfort, but I'm not sure if like so many things, it's too, too little too late. I mean, honestly, do you think that you can really say that user experience has improved because of what we've done technically? Would you say that? Hmm. It's a really good question. It's difficult to step back and see that from that point of view for myself, since I'm in the thick of it. However, of course, I'm, that's why I'm saying user, yeah. user testing is so important. Exactly. And I think it's the focus on continually making sure that you're getting that unbiased feedback from end users yes. and be able to supply that information to the teams that are creating the products that you're talking about, the processes, the environments, all those things, because without it, you are in your own bubble and mm -hmm. you're not seeing clearly. So I think it's a constant, it's, it's a constant effort. It is. And, it, and I think that's a very good point. And something that I also think a lot about is that we don't iterate our conversations enough. For example, right now, if you go to a website, um, this whole thing with the cookies, okay, the cookies acceptance, what's the first thing you have to do? The first thing you have to do when you go to a website that's complying with the laws that are saying they have to um, be, uh, they ha you have to uh, give explicit permission to accept third party cookies, right? You know what I'm talking about, the little pop-ups that come yeah. up on the websites now, and you have to, they, yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's coming through legal moves to protect, to protect security and privacy, which is not protected anyway. <laughs> so I mean, it's kind of redundant, but look at when you think about a person who has to either listen, see, or mobility, uh, any kind of impairment or challenge, even if you have a broken arm and you're, or whatever, and you can't, that's another step you have to take. Mm -hmm. Then you click that and it has to reload. And then you may get a little chat pop-up that says, if you need help, or somebody starts talking to you through, or, or some kind of the advertising. I mean, there's so much on a page that it becomes so overwhelming. Most people do not know. The more choices, this is a sociological concept that is believed to be uh, gaining enough critical mass and, and research to be considered possibly a true fact. And that is you give too many people too many choices they don't know what to do. They freeze or they revert to the one that is the one they are most familiar with. 
as opposed to what might be the best choice for that project or for that process or for the user experience. So I think we're not thinking about it and we're not talking about it. And part of the problem is, is that we don't have any centralized movement anymore. We've become so huge in organ, you know, huge in industry with so many different specialties that we stopped talking to each other. Um, we talk at each other through social media. And of course, COVID hasn't helped in that we don't have a lot of face-to-face -face sit downs and ability to really hash these things out. The W3C has gone down, through a lot of real problems and you know, is, is still working and doing good work, but they struggle. There's no more web standards project. You know, there's no singular um, organization. There's a lot of user experience organizations and there's a lot of accessibility organizations, but darned if you're able to figure out the right ones, you know, the ones that are, you have right. to know people in the industry. So I really worry about people coming into the industry, not knowing how to find the right information. Yeah. And that's what I was going to ask you is, you know, so everything we've been talking about, if someone is trying to get in this industry, is, is there some words of advice that you would give them? I would say find your elders um, and hang on to them, you know, really, really uh, <clears throat> look, look, at, look at the original thinkers and the people who did, if you're, if you're going into user experience, um, you definitely need to, to be involved in accessibility. You need to be involved in, in markup. You need to know everything about the web. Usability really, really is not just about user interface design. Usability is a quality assurance process. And it means that you start day one and you iterate and you iterate. And the workflow has to, has to change. We do not have, you know, we were talking about this earlier about, you know, when we were uh, of a generation, our, my, my mother, when she was a PhD, she got with a university, she stayed there for 35 years, right? Never changed her job, was employed by the same place. This is not our reality. We're constantly moving. So we don't really know where to go for that infrastructure. And so what I think that people have to realize is that user experience and user interface design and UX is such a large uh, industry of itself with very specific silos of specialties, if we're gonna look at it through that viewport, that uh, it, it, it may be a very, uh, it may require more higher education. I think that's what I'm coming to, to be honest. I think, I think to wrap that up into a real answer is that I believe it's time we begin to look at real long-term education. And I know people don't wanna hear that, but there are ways to do it that do not involve having to go the route of traditional higher education, okay? And you know, kids are kids are smarter now than their than their teachers in in, in lower in K twelve, right? So when you look at K twelve, you get these fourteen year olds with people my age teaching them, and the fourteen year olds know more than I do about how to do technology, right? So what's wrong with that picture? Obviously, education is not rolling fast enough ahead to help us define these things and give us the information that these people coming into an industry actually need. And I was just, I have a, an anecdote about this that was very disturbing to me where I attended a user experience event and a young woman who had just gotten a position, she was very smart, very bright um, and very willing to learn. And she was leading an entire company's user experience. And she kept her, her entire conversation with me was, well, when should I or shouldn't I use alt text for the blind? And I'm just like, it is 30 years that we have been talking about this. How is it possible that this person got hired as the lead for digital accessibility user interface and, and interaction design at a major corporation and doesn't know that? How does that happen? Lack of education, lack of cohesive infrastructure and information overload. And Good that's, advice. these are the things that I think are contributing. I'm sure there's many more. So I think that education, no matter, you know, I don't, I, I'm not talking certification. I'm not talking degrees. I'm talking about some kind of unified process where people are able to learn these mm -hmm. things that they're not getting from the formal education because there is no rubric. There is no universal rubric. 
for for testing a person's in you know knowledge or how to go about doing those things this is not a conversation a lead at a major company should be having with the public and and giving erroneous information to the public because it perpetuates the problems so i, I felt really badly for her and i felt really badly for what was going to happen down the road and how do you deal with that so i can only go to the core issue as an educator a writer a person who's advocated for accessibility for user um, for users in general. I'm for the user. And um, to stand with the users means that you have to be stop, we have to stop thinking about our own limitations and we have to start thinking beyond our, we have to start thinking beyond our biases, which we all have, of course, yes. uh, and and uh, and get away from the heuristics, get away from the cognitive bias, and begin to really understand what making a user happy means and the only way to do that is to ask people using and can ask Eyes. them again and ask them <laughs> right. again and ask them again and never stop yeah i i totally agree well i wish you the best of luck on your Thank current you. project i can't wait to get my hands on it and it was a pleasure catching up it's with a thought you book it's it's just for the record uh yeah. it's not really a how-to book because there's plenty okay. of that out there all right. right. It is a. It's about changing our thinking exactly mm -hmm. this way. About re-evaluating where accessibility really belongs in the hierarchy. Is it subsumed under UX? No. I think UX and access accessibility comes before everything. Because if you can't access something, you can't use it. Right. So there's no user experience to study if a person can't get to the experience. So I'm saying accessibility first, and that's my uh, that's my mantra these days. <laughs> so hopefully that's a good helpful mantra. To you. Thank you. <laughs> well, thank you thank so you much. Thank you for the work you're doing. Thank you for this. It's a very interesting. I really truly look forward to what other people have to say, and uh, it's a very interesting project, Mark. Thank you for including me. You're welcome. Thank you, Molly. Thank you.